I move all the time with my mom. She's always broke. She spends all her money on drugs. She thinks I don't know, but I see them. I, and I see her. When she's really desperate, she uses me to... Well, I don't want to talk about it. I pretend I'm somewhere else. I don't like looking at people. They might know what goes on. Someone told me I had sad eyes and I just turned away. Did they know why? I don't care. I don't know if I'll ever be a mom, but if I am, I will not be like my mom. I'm tired now. I don't want to talk anymore. When I started this, I didn't realize the extent to which children were vulnerable to predators outside the home as a result of hunger. And then I didn't realize the extent to which food was weaponized inside the home. You don't know what the face of hunger looks like. The face of hunger can look like anything. It can look like a five-year-old, a teenager. It can look like anything. I think that there can be judgment around hunger, and there shouldn't be any judgment around a child being hungry. My name is Holly Slade, and I'm the executive director for Feed New Mexico Kids. And years ago, I was working on a project for human trafficking and I stumbled across the correlation between hunger and human trafficking. And then as I was doing more research, I stumbled across the information that New Mexico led the nation in childhood hunger. And so I kept thinking, you know, somebody needs to do something, somebody needs to do something. And then one morning you wake up and you look in the mirror and you are that somebody. My name is Nikki Wolf. I am with the Valencia County Feed New Mexico Kids representative. There's so many issues in our community, it was kind of overwhelming, like where do you step out? Where do you, how can you help? And I was listening to the radio one day and I heard Holly on the radio and she mentioned that they were looking at opening, having a branch in um, Las Cruces. My name is Tracy Rodden and I'm a community coordinator with Feed New Mexico Kids, which means that I help our partners, which could be churches, individuals, or businesses, learn more about how they can participate and help with Feed New Mexico Kids. The challenges these kids face run the gamut. Um, I, I think that there can be judgment around hunger and there shouldn't be any judgment around a child being hungry because sometimes it's very hardworking single parents who have just had difficult circumstance come upon them. Sometimes it's very hardworking intact families um, with very good intentions. Like one story is a, a family of four and um, the mom's sister passed away so they took in their four children. Well then her husband died. So now we have a single mom with eight children. Then we have an epidemic of grandparents who are taking care of multiple grandchildren and great-grandchildren um, because this parent is deceased and that one's in jail and that one's on drugs and all kinds of circumstances going on and these are good hard-working grandparents. And then we do have the other end of the spectrum where we've got neglectful and even abusive um, parents that are the cause of hunger. So the, the challenges these kids face um, go from, you know, just not knowing or not having resources around to really um, food being weaponized and used as a tool of abuse. There was one little girl who was noticeably thin and teachers and officials were involved and finally Health and Human Services came and and um, removed her from the home and they were gathering up her things and under her bed they found all kinds of our empty snack packs. She had been having to hide that she was eating. The parents were intentionally um, withholding food from her to the point where she was, you know, had failure to thrive, malnourishment, and was getting sickly, couldn't concentrate in school. So starving your own child is a form of child abuse that is practiced in our community. I don't really have any friends. The other kids are mean to me. I take their food when they are not looking. I can't help it. I'm so hungry.
They tease me because I'm skinny and sometimes my clothes are dirty. I don't get to eat very much. At home, I hide my food under my bed so my mom does not see it. She'd be mad if she found it. She hurt me real bad one time when she saw me sneaking food. I hide it from her now. I can't eat until I do what she wants, and I can't do what she wants. I try, but she does not like how I do it, so she does not let me eat. When I was thinking about this program, I wanted to make sure that the food got to the child and wasn't intercepted by an older sibling or a cousin or an ill-intentioned parent. And that's why what we do is the single serve, easy open food that kindergarten through high school can eat. A lot of the food bank food is for family food, so it's rice and beans and things, and it takes time to get that cooked and ready. But this is easy, so if there's not an adult home, they can eat. If they're living in a car, if they're living in a motel, if they're living on the street, they've got food to open and eat. Because we, we had one little guy who was, he relocated to Albuquerque with his mom and they were living in a motel. So when you're living in a motel, rice and beans and meat and dairy and all that doesn't work. This is, this is a very different population where if you have dinner that night, it might be a Coke from the vending machine. This is a snack pack. Right now the pack costs just a little under $4. Every snack pack is full of single serve, easy open food that a child can open and eat on their own. Okay, no microwave, no can opener. A kindergartner has to be able to open and eat this food. Um, you'll see in the front of every pack we have a note of encouragement and children will hang them up in their bedroom. And then we try and balance it with protein and belly fillers. So really the cornerstone of it is a flip top lid of either beef ravioli or spaghetti and meatballs. And then we put in um, a single serve mac and cheese and that actually doesn't require a microwave because the kids who are truly on their own, out on the street, maybe living in a car or in a tunnel, they can go to one of the corner stores and get hot water. And they'll let them have hot water as long as they have their own container. And so then there's a packet of oatmeal. There's a pudding and there's trail mix and a package of peanuts, a protein bar, a cereal bar. There's ramen. Kids eat ramen dry and it's a belly filler. And then the reason we put it in a Ziploc bag is so that if something's half eaten, it can go back in the Ziploc bag and they can zip it shut because it really is intended to last the weekend. And the other reason that we do a Ziploc bag is because of some of the stigmatization that goes on if a child is carrying two backpacks. It's really hard to convince a mid-high or a high school kid, even when they're hungry, to override the social pressure and the peer pressure and take that second um, backpack. It seemed the best way to find hungry children was to go through the school. And so when I called the division of, of APS, I said, if I can get food, can you get it to the right children? And they said, absolutely. The teachers tell the counselors, um, the kids that they th they're concerned about not getting enough food, or they've noticed maybe they're sleeping in class, or you know, asking for other people's food during lunch or breakfast, and then they identify the kids, and then the counselors at our schools are the ones who actually get the food to the kiddos. Part of it is to make sure that there's a responsible adult in the chain, so that if a child has a food allergy, or if they have a medical condition, or if there's something in the snack pack that that child shouldn't have, the school actually knows that. And so that's why we go through the school in case there is a situation where a parent is not aware that their child is receiving a snack pack, that we have an informed adult monitoring what the child is getting. I have this food in my backpack. No one knows about it but me. Well, my teacher knows because he puts it in there. He saw me always asking for food at lunch. I was embarrassed when he asked me if I had food at home. I didn't want to tell him, so I just stayed quiet. I guess he knows, though, because I have food now. I don't eat it until I'm alone, though. The other kids will ask me for some. If I go home, my brother and sister will take it. So I hide it in my bag. 
I come here because no one can find me. I feel safe here. One of the beautiful things about what God has done for me is I was a food insecure child. Um, because of that, I lived through a lot of trauma. But when I became a believer at the age of 19, God really like healed me of that and brought me to the other side to then use me in an effective way. I became food insecure about the age of seven. My mom raised my sister and I for many years on her own and she was um, incapacitated through different things, um, drugs and alcohol. And so as young children, my sister and I really struggled to eat regularly. My mom would wake up really early in the morning and she would drop us off at our school and we would go in the back door of the cafeteria and we would work in the cafeteria and then because we were working in the cafeteria helping to prepare food, we were able to then eat breakfast and that's how we got food. I lived in that kind of life till I was probably 12. I do think I came out of that because my living environment changed. I went to live with my dad and so my food insecurities went away. But the thing about being food insecure as a child is it never goes away. It's always with you. You always think about it. Um, Costco loves me. I have a full pantry all the time and I notice it all the time in either people or children. It's something that I can see very easily. As I speak to people about childhood hunger in New Mexico, what I'm finding is people aren't really aware of it. And then a lot of things people say to me is, well, where are their parents? You know, aren't they getting help from the government? Children are not in school 24 seven. And you know, for us, a three day weekend is a holiday and we're so excited. But for children, that's just an extra day. They know they're not gonna get food at school. And so the snack packs can help bridge that gap as well as Thanksgiving holiday, Christmas holiday, summer break is a really big one. I think most New Mexicans don't know that we lead the nation in childhood hunger. So the challenge is to increase awareness, but then a lot of people just have compassion fatigue. And so once they're aware, they might feel badly, but not do anything about it. And so it's not just the awareness component, it's awareness leading to action. Once somebody is aware of a situation like this, they have a responsibility to do something. Within a 15 mile radius of anyone, no matter where you live, there is at least one hungry child. And if you could attach a name and a face and an address to that child, and somebody were to say, you're the only person that knows that that child's hungry. You would do something about it, right? Whether it was weekly food delivery or whether you got them a Target gift card, you would figure out a way to do something if somebody told you you're the only one. Helping children with food insecurity is something everybody can do. And if everybody gets involved just a little bit, just do one thing, pack a snack pack, um, pick up an extra case of ravioli when you're at the Costco or Sam's Club, you know, start something in your community, then we actually have a shot at ending childhood hunger in New Mexico, which would change the dynamics of our state in a huge way. If everybody decides that it's up to somebody else, we're never gonna solve the problem. It's going to take everybody who has awareness taking some kind of action. The way Feed New Mexico Kids is set up is similar to a franchise where you can duplicate the process that we've already found to be very successful. So you could be the person that starts a Feed New Mexico Kids in that community. One of the first things we had to do was talk to our pastor of the local church where we attended. From there we had to go to a board that works with um, programs and ministries out of the church and we had to present it to them and get those people on board. And then after we got the church on board, we had to go to our local schools. Um, so I called the principals of all of our local schools. I started with two or three. And we told them about the program and to see if they had a need for that program in their school. All of the principals that we talked to did, and then they connected us with their counselors, the school counselors, to get numbers and really what that was gonna look like and how we would work through them. After it's up and going like now, 
We have a pretty good system, so really it takes, I'm involved probably two to three, maybe two hours a week. Most of my packing team, they volunteer once a month and that's 30 to 45 minutes. And then I have some weekly volunteers and they are usually my delivery people because it has to be somebody very dependable. And the delivery people, it's probably an hour a week. So in some different types of volunteers, we have the packing volunteers. They're gonna pack the bags every week. We have a shopping volunteer and that person would shop for the food. They could either order it online and then we have stocking, people who stock, because whenever the food comes in from Costco or Sam's, then we need it all emptied out of the boxes. We have shelving that's all um, labeled and organized from and what's expiring to what's not expiring. Another volunteer we need are the people who deliver. If you want to participate, whatever you bring is on the list. So people are so kind and generous and they'll bring a bag of pancake mix, right? Which is you know kind but that's not something a five-year-old can make so we just ask people to stick to what's on the list you can find where to drop off food through feednmkids.com last year we put out a little over 86,000 snack packs um, in the year and so that's three hundred and forty four thousand dollars the model has been that it has doubled each year so next year we're anticipating we'll need $688,000 in order to do what we need to do. The average school gets around 20 snack packs for the school. And if one person or a small group of people were to adopt one school, 20 children, for the 36 weeks of school, that's only $2,800 a year. People can donate monthly and it becomes very um, affordable. If one person wants to adopt one child, all year long, that's, tw that's $16 a month. And if you break it down even more simple than that, it's $4 a week. I, I see the prices at, at the local coffee houses, um, you know, even if you wanna go out to lunch. I mean, the, the decisions that we have to make in our life to cut out something to afford $4 a week are so minimal to most of us. And yet, to a hungry child, it's the difference between eating on the weekend and not eating on the weekend. The people that go to the church are the largest uh, support of the program. Um, in the last couple of years though, we've got community support. We, get, um, we have local businesses who give once a month, large businesses, small businesses, they donate. We also, have, and they donate food or financially. And then we have civic groups. We have our local Rotary Club, the Kiwanis Club, that they donate um, yearly or monthly also to support. No one person can do something like this alone. I have a full-time job, I have a career, I run a company, and so I don't have, you know, hours and hours each week to donate to this, but I know, I know people. And so it's a matter of talking to people and finding people who had similar interest. Here's the thing about serving in your community. If you're lonely, you'll be with other people. If you're hungry, you're probably going to get fed because when people serve, you want to feed them, right? You want to keep them happy, you know. Um, also, when you serve, you become less of a depressed person. You know, we see a lot of depression in our society right now, and that's usually because we're focused on ourselves. And when we serve, we can focus on somebody else. And also, when you serve, you learn how to be the hands and feet of Christ. Feed New Mexico Kids has impacted our lives in that we feel like that we are making a difference. Our church is making a difference. Our family can make a difference. My small kids can be involved in packing bags, um, getting to see us volunteer, and then they get to volunteer. They know it's a routine. We do it every week. Um, and it's important to see for them to see us serve the community. So if anybody has an inkling that they would like to get involved, we can design a program for them. My mom died, and my dad is never home. He works all the time. He does not know how to shop. There's never any food in our house. I eat at school, but the weekend comes, and there's nothing. I think my dad eats at work, but forgets to bring me home any. Sometimes my friends will bring me food at school so I have something to eat for dinner that night, but I usually don't eat. I try my best to look normal. I don't know how to make my hair look pretty. I think mom show you, but I didn't get to know my mom. Anyways. I hide my hunger. No one knows but my close friends. You know, the ones that bring me food sometimes. But now I find this bag of food in my backpack. 
I think my teacher puts it there. I have food now on the weekends, and sometimes I will eat it at night if I'm very hungry. The program has the ability to just give these kids hope where they have no hope. I, I can't imagine what it's like knowing each day or not knowing each day where your next meal is coming from. Because that's the definition of food insecurity, is not knowing where your next meal is coming from. And so think about what that is like to just have that lingering in the background every day. When you go home from school, there may be dinner, there may not be dinner, and, and you won't know what dinner is. It might be a couple of Cheez-Its. Or on the weekend, what really happens is kids on Friday end up dreading the weekend because they know that there's no hope. And the statistics are that a hungry child is twice as likely to get suspended, three times as likely to repeat a grade, and a hungry teen is five times as likely to commit suicide. Food becomes this tool, this entity, that can change the trajectory of a child's life. And that's largely what we want to do. We're not, we're not trying to earn a trophy, congratulations, we ended childhood hunger in New Mexico. We're trying to change the trajectory of their lives. Because if a hungry 13-year-old boy who is burning 3,000 calories a day standing still um, has a choice, he's going to go to school that day or he's going to go to the corner store and steal something to eat, probably just that drive to survive is going to send him to the corner store to steal food just to eat. And then there's protection in numbers. So if you have to steal food just to eat, what are the chances that you might join a gang? So that you've got people around you that help you steal or watch your back, and then that leads into maybe selling drugs so that you can have money to buy food now instead of stealing it. And I'm not condoning any of those actions. I'm saying that if we keep pulling back the layers of the onion, we might actually get to a starting point that can eliminate some of the problems that we have in New Mexico. 16 years, that's how long I've been hungry. I can't remember the first time I was hungry. But I'm 16 now, and I'm always hungry. I don't like to talk about it. It's bad enough that I crash in a different home on a different couch each night. I don't want my friends to know I'm hungry too. Sometimes, when it's really bad, I feel I've got no choice but to take what I can, when I can, even if it means without paying for it. I have no money. What else am I supposed to do? Someday, I'll get out of this. It'll be different. Someday, it will get better. Every child is going to become an adult. Sometimes that's a hard thing for us to wrap our mind around, but what kind of adult do you want that child to become in, in your society, in your community, in your home? And a lot of these children are living what their parents lived in this cycle, whatever that cycle is, drugs, alcohol, poverty, sometimes all of it. And will they continue that cycle or will they be able to break free? And I'm one of the few people in my family that has been able to break free from that cycle. We know that impact is happening. The parents tell us beautiful stories about their children just being happier. Um, the teachers tell us the kids return in Monday morning able to concentrate. Um, able to learn, ready to learn, whereas before Monday morning was a real problem because they were so hungry um, from not eating over the weekend. In terms of the impact in my life, it's hard to put into words. There's lots of days I just sit at my desk and cry and then take action. <laughs>
but overall, probably the most meaningful thing I've ever done. I think it's important for us to remember that these are God's kids, these are His children, and um, we are just His hands and feet, and this is His ministry. I think the thing that is most important and pressing on my heart to share is how responsible we all are if we're going to be a community, if we're going to be a civilized society then we have a responsibility to take care of our youngest and most vulnerable. You as a responsible member of society have, have an obligation to do something. Just do something. And together we can all eradicate childhood hunger in this state.